Okay, that's great. And again, uh, since I, I sent this off last night, I was able to ascertain a, a bunch of answers to the list of questions I had here. And I know that the, uh, again, the CCCE group has uh, a question very similar to my question number one. So uh, I will conclude um, uh, from here and thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, Jane. Thank you. We've, okay, we're just gonna wait for a minute till um, Christina gets him off the Zoom and then we'll move on. Brian, go ahead. Can I get a motion to receive that, Your Worship? Oh yeah, sorry, I can have a motion to receive this move. Moved by Sherry, second by Doug. All in favor? Motion's carried. Sorry guys, it's Jason here. I just received an email from Wenda. I'm not sure if everybody did. Um, asking that I let Christina know that she can't see the Zoom link for tonight's meeting and she would like it resent. Your Worship, if you wish to proceed, we'll work on getting that link to her. Okay, is Christina ready to move on? Yes, I, I'm sending that link, Your Worship. Yes. Okay, good. Enough. Okay, fine. Okay, can we, can we have the approval for the January 18th meeting tonight? Moved by Debbie. Second by Doug. Any questions or comments on it? All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Any conflicts or pecuniary interests or the general nature thereof? Showing none. I would like the approval of the January 4th, 2021 Stone Mills regular council meeting. Moved by Kevin, second by Doug. Any questions or comments? All in favor of the motion? Motion's carried. Delegation, deputation, presentation. Tonight we have a presentation, Prince Edward Lennox and Addicts and Social Services Housing presentation by Connor, Connor Dory. Good evening, Connor. Good evening. Okay, you. Perfect, everybody can hear me? I think so. Yeah, Sounds good. Thank you everyone. Uh, yeah, first off, just thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of council this evening. Um, it's often stated that we're currently living in a housing crisis and we are, um, we're, we're seeing high demand, a lack of supply, um, landlord and tenant issues, the affordability piece. There's a lot of things that are contributing to a housing crisis. Um, that list is large and complex, but it's important <laughs> that we do recognize that we are in a housing crisis. And that's what brings me here this evening as a representative of Prince Edward Lennox and Addington Social Services is to talk about our services involved within housing and our priorities moving forward in addressing the housing issues that we do see. Um, just to provide some context and background, which I'm sure you're aware, is that in 2000, the County of Lennox and, At the County of Lennox and Addington was designated as the Consolidated, Ser Ser Condolidate Consolidated Municipal Services Manager for the counties of Prince Edward and Lennox and Addington. And through our social services department, Prince Edward Lennox and Addington Social Services, which is commonly referred to as PELIS, we provide various programs and services. These include Children's Services, Ontario Works, and Housing Services. When we talk about housing services, there are a wide range of services and programs that are available that do have influence on our local municipalities. Um, these programs are supported by federal and provincial, as well as municipal avenues. And when we talk about housing services, in many instances, phrases and terminology is used that isn't, um, that clear definitions aren't used or provided. Um, so you'll see in, in tonight's paperwork that was provided beforehand that there is some definitions that we use um, when talking about our programs and services. So when we look at housing um, in particular, I like to look at the way that our services are provided in three different streams. We have the rent gear to income avenue, which is commonly referred to as social or community housing. We have attainable housing options which encompasses many different ways that encourage affordability. And then we have initiatives that focus on homelessness. On the one slide, you will see 
uh, a graphic of the housing continuum. And that is, if there is one slide that I want you to take away from this evening, it would be that one. The housing continuum is at its simplest, the range of housing types available in a community from emergency, from emergency shelters on one end, all the way to home ownership on the other. And in between that lies an assortment of housing options and types, which are each critically important for different people at different times. Um, we at Palace are mainly involved in the early stages of the housing continuum. However, we recognize that the impacts in the earlier stages of the continuum do influence later stages. We also recognize that all these housing types are very interconnected. And when we talk about a housing crisis, each one of these housing types have um, different issues that, that do need to be focused on. We also recognize that anything, or sorry, we recognize that different things can happen in, that, in any individual's life at any point that may influence where they land on that the housing continuum. So when we talk about to go back to the rent gear to income housing, rent gear to income housing is provided in three different streams. The first being the local housing corporation, which is us at Palace. We within Palace operate and administer 413 units across the service area. These units are family units, single units or seniors units. Um, we do have one building in Stone Mills. The rent of the tenants is determined by a rent gear to income calculation, which is part of the administration side of things. Rent gear to income housing is also provided through nonprofit housing providers. And within Prince Edward, Lennox and Addington, there are six providers of over 200 units. Um, Pellis financially supports these, pro these programs and providers, but we also help them on the administration side and if they have any program related issues that we can work with them through. And the last piece of the rent gear to income housing is uh, rent supplements. Rent supplements is housing in which payments are made to landlords on behalf of households in need of rental assistance. And the subsidy is calculated in the same way that they are for the local housing corporation, as well as the nonprofit providers. On average, we support 141 households monthly through agreements with landlords. So aside from the rent geared to income housing, there are other options and programs available within Palace and our housing. Um, and we, we can refer to them as attainable housing options, which is a wide range of options that encourage affordability. They do depend on federal and provincial funding. One of those programs would be home ownership programs, which, um, which focus on helping or supporting low to mid income households in the purchase of a home through a forgivable loan. We also look at partnering with community partners, uh, as well as the private sector. Um, there's four pictures on the one slide that are examples within our Prince Edward, Lennox and Nannington of private public partnerships. Um, we utilize the strengths of the private market while providing forgivable loans that ensured that the rental rates that they set within these buildings were at 80% of the average market rent, which is set by Canada and Mortgage Housing Corporation. Um, by looking at these types of opportunities, we can be innovative. And one example of that, and you see it in the picture, is the uh, building with the snow on the roof. That's a, a two unit build that was done in Flinton, which is a great model for a rural community while also ensuring that the operators of the units themselves are financially viable. And then lastly, when we talk about attainable housing options, I just wanna mention the local housing corporation, uh, which is administered through Pellis. We are mandated to provide a certain number of rent geared to income units, um, but the province has identified that this is being looked at right now. Um, we are also considering ways that maybe we can expand on our portfolio that would include the affordable housing options. So that being at 80% of the market rent. So I just wanted to put that in there because it is something that is being considered. Um, and then the last part of the portfolio I just wanted to discuss tonight was homelessness. Um, we provide support to community partners who are working directly with people who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. We provide financial assistance to individuals who are at risk of losing their current living arrangement. We provide supports for emergency shelters through motel and hotel stays. And we also um, support transitional housing. So that helps bridge the gap between homelessness and more long-term housing arrangements. So it's a very large portfolio and I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, 
Um, but, but it's important to have that context of what housing services looks like within our organization and the different types of programs we, we do provide. Um, through our portfolio, we do recognize that there is a change in environment and that we need to continue to set priorities moving forward while all con also considering the, the housing crisis that is often discussed. Um, simply, it, it is a result of demand with a lack of supply that is driving costs. And when we look at demand currently on our housing waitlist, there are over 700 households. Um, and three years ago in January of 2018, that list was at 500 households. So we are seeing growth in that, um, in the waitlist. And to be eligible for our waitlist, you have to be below a, an income threshold. Um, and we do have to deny people from being on the waitlist due to that they make more money than that uh, income threshold would be at. So, so there is clearly a demand. Um, there is a lack of supply and a lack of growth of supply over time, which does add stress on the existing supply, as well as uh, we can see that through our vacancy rates in the community. Um, so back to that housing continuum graphic, and I'm not sure if you have the PowerPoint up on your screen or not, if it's the paper copy, but when we see people move further along in the housing continuum, it can open up availability for other individuals to change their position. But what we're seeing is a divide from the two ends of that spectrum, which is putting more pressures on the earlier stages of the housing continuum, because there is that less movement. And when we look at the housing continuum, those earlier stages, so that being homeless, um, this emergency shelters, transitional housing or social housing, those are the more costly types of housings. So we have to take a look at that and see how, um, how these housing types are connected. So when we look at, at the issues before us, we in Pellis are, are taking different initiatives to address this. Um, one of that would be the housing revitalization plan that was done in 2019. The housing revitalization plan looked at our portfolio and classified our properties into four different categories, that being dispose of, um, redevelop, revitalize, or retain, um, while also identifying the need for a new acquisition or a new build within our portfolio. Um, it's a long 20, it's a long term plan, 20 years, um, but we're starting the early implementation, implementation, implementation stages of the plan. Um, but the first being we are currently in the process of disposing of one of our properties with the intent of using the, the proceeds from the sale to the development of more housing stock within our area. But the housing revitalization plan is only a small piece of the puzzle and there are a lot of other things that we need, we need to do. And moving forward, we have identified um, priorities, one being using data and local data to ensure that we are making evidence-based decisions when it comes to housing. Um, we are looking at modernizing housing in the way that when we look at our current housing portfolio, it is not the most conducive environment for tenants. Um, we want to modernize housing options by considering innovative and forward thinking ideas. It's clear from the federal and provincial levels that they're moving towards a model um, that is a modular housing model. We've seen that from recent announcements when it comes to funding opportunities. So we need to consider these types of the programs locally if we want to utilize those funds that do become available. And we also want to look at modernizing by having mixed use buildings where we can incorporate rent geared to income units with affordable housing units, um, as well as market rent units. So having that mixed model is something that we, we do see being necessary moving forward. We also need to prepare for the future, especially with the impacts of COVID as we are seeing, um, it seems as if people are leaving the bigger cities to, to come to more rural areas. If that, is, if that continues, there's gonna be added pressures within our um, housing stock that we do need to consider. We also have to prepare for the future by funding opportunities. That, there, there was a federal announcement with the $1 billion investment into affordable housing and it, in order for that to be received by a municipality, um, occupancy had to be met, or sorry, there had to be occupancy within the unit within 12 months, and it, had, it was required if it was a new build to be modular housing. 
if we are prepared locally for these future funding opportunities, we can be more prepared to submit applications be, and be confident that um, we're putting ourselves in a good position to receive the funds. So it's being prepared locally for those opportunities is a priority. And then lastly, for priorities is the partnership side. We recognize the need for partnerships with the federal and provincial government, um, with the private stakeholders, as well as community partners, and then of course our municipal partners. It's often said that county is a, sorry, housing is a county issue. Housing's not a county issue. Housing's a county service. Um, housing's an issue that's fa facing all levels of government, so we need to find ways to work collaboratively to help move forward on solving the issues that, that are present within the housing sectors. Um, so I know I'm, I threw a lot of information at you, and this is just scratching the surface, but what, what I intended on doing this evening is just to, to make sure that housing um, is considered to be a priority on all of our agendas and that we, we continue to work forward. Um, I really do appreciate everybody giving me the opportunity to speak this evening and I'd be happy to answer any questions about our portfolio and our services if anyone has any. Anybody have any questions for Connor? Go ahead, John. Yes, thank you. Um, Connor, could you expand a little bit? You mentioned that the province and the federal government are moving towards a modular type of housing. Can you explain what that means? So that, that's the, the prefabricated housing, um, not necessarily tiny homes, but prefabricated offsite and then shipped um, to, to, the, to the site, wherever it is, is determined. You're seeing, um, you're seeing examples of these more so in Toronto. There, there's great examples of modular housing that it actually are apartment buildings. So, it, so it's, it's a quicker, more efficient way. In terms of costs, there's different thoughts on if it's less or more expensive, um, but, it, but it's a more rapid way to get housing in stock. And that's where the federal government's rapid housing initiative with the 12 months occupancy prior, made it mandatory to have the modular housing um, just to meet those timelines. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so, so would, that, would that sort of housing be for single individuals? Or are we talking about homeless people or, or is there modular housing uh, geared towards families as well? The, the modular housing is very flexible. Um, it could be for singles. There are examples of modular housing being used for family homes. Um, a, a local example is if you're on the 401 heading west towards Toronto, Bonville Homes in Belleville area, th that is a modular housing um, fabricator. They, they, they manufacture the modular housing. So there's different producers of it. Um, and it's, like I said, it's flexible in that it can be singles or it could be a family home. And, and how do these units differ, say, from your typical um, low-cost trailer park type dwelling? Uh, are, they, are they durable? Are they energy efficient? Um, what, what makes them different from small housing options that we've had before? I, I do see the chief building official. Um, he might be able to help on this one. Go ahead, Jake. So yeah, they have to be built to the building code, John. Um, they they need to meet all the energy efficiency codes that any other on-site structure would meet. Um, park model trailers are not for year-round use. Um, so he's not talking, when he means modular, he means uh, essentially a factory built home, just like the one that you're installing anywhere else in Stone Mills on site. Uh, he's not talking about park models. Those are for seasonal use. Okay, thank you. Cool. Anybody else have any questions? Go ahead, John. Yeah, just, just one more. Um, can a municipality, Connor, um, uh, request of a developer who's applying, say, for a, a subdivision um, agreement uh, um, demand or, or have some sort of formula to include affordable housing as part of the housing stock in a subdivision or an apartment? Yes, they can from my understanding and um, Jason Sands might be able to help out there, but 
uh, municipalities have implemented um, bylaws to, to encourage that. But from my understanding, yes. That, that would seem to be something that maybe should be in, in our official plans. Uh, it would have to be done on a county or even a regional basis. Otherwise, it, it could just inhibit developers from from building in a, in a local area. But uh, uh, there's certainly no incentive in a free market system um, for a developer to to include affordable housing in the mix. In fact, um, when you think of it as a supply and demand problem, at least this is kind of what I have been thinking about this, um, it's in the interest of the development industry to keep the housing supply short. That's what keeps prices high. If, if they build too many units, the prices come down, um, which makes things affordable, uh, but which also makes things less profitable. So it's kind of a flaw in the free market model um, when it comes to things like housing. Anyway, that's just a little speech. Thank you. Jason, you want to say? Through you, Your Worship, just uh, very quickly to assist uh, in the question from Deputy Reeve Wise and the response provided already from Mr. Dory. Um, the Planning Act does allow municipalities to require applicants to provide a, a component of development to be considered affordable. Uh, it is often described or prescribed in, in municipal documentation and policies. Currently, our township's official plan does require, sorry, it does request applicants to provide uh, an affordable component to their development. Um, and Deputy Reeve Wise and I have discussed this previously, um, but for everybody else on this call, there are considerations that uh, the Planning Act allows municipalities to impose on developers when they are seeking to step outside of the bounds of what the zoning permits. So for example, uh, I'll use an urban example just quickly. If there is a, an urban situation where a three-story residential apartment building is permitted and the developer is seeking a five-story residential building, um, they need often zoning amendment changes um, and or policy amendments to facilitate that development. Through those requests, that's the, sec that's the opportune time for a municipality, it's, a, it's actually section 37 of the Planning Act, to consider what's called density bonusing on an applicant to demonstrate and provide a portion of that development to be considered affordable. And that's when um, representatives such as Palace can get involved to speak to the requirement of rent geared to income um, or whichever form of affordable housing, quote unquote, that they want it to come in to the municipality. Um, so often in a rural municipality, bringing it back to Stone Mills, where we're not see seeing the majority of our applications as being great large intensification projects, um, the OP, the official plan policies that speak to that component of affordable housing often then only becomes applicable when you're talking about larger form developments, such as plan of subdivisions, um, as opposed to single lot creation and single family dwelling development like we typically see. So all that being said, um, should the municipality move forward into the 2021 year with uh, applicants bringing forward more plan of subdivision type applications than we've historically seen, then there's more leverage, I would say, an opportunity for the municipality and palace of the world to impose policy regulations on those applicants to provide uh, or at least demonstrate how their proposed development is providing and contributing to affordable housing throughout our neighbor, through our, our municipality. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Connor? I guess seeing none, Connor, I um, appreciate you coming out. Uh, I sit on the Palace Board through the county and your group do a great job. So with that again, I'm gonna say thank you. And with that being said, could I have a motion to receive the report? Moved by Kevin, second by Sherry. All in favor of the motion? Motion carried. Good night. 
Christina, we got to wait till he gets off, or can we go on? You can go ahead. Great. Okay. Thank you. Our second delegation is community citizens of the Community Environment Incorporated pertaining to the site plan agreement SP04 2019 Slag Farm request to withdraw from site plan agreement. I think Mark Oliver is going to go with this. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you for this opportunity to address council tonight as a spokesperson for the concerned citizens for our community environments. It is noted in tonight's agenda that Slack Family Farms wishes to withdraw from the site plan control agreement that was executed on May 20th of 2020. This development generates a need for three important actions that we call on council to take. First, Stone Mills Township has incurred significant expenses attributable to the site plan control agreement, such as legal and professional fees. According to the terms in sections 15 and 17 of that site plan control agreement, all invoices, costs, and expenses are to be paid by Slack Family Farms. The taxpayers of the township should not bear the burden of these costs. For this reason, we call on council to ensure that no agreement for Slack Family Farms to withdraw from the site plan control agreement be given without first being reimbursed by Slack Family Farms for the costs and expenses incurred in this process. Now, secondly, the construction of a marginally smaller barn does not remove the risks to health and safety of residents and the environment. We trust that council has ensured that the conditions attached to the site plan control agreement and the additional recommendations from XCG are now attached to the new building permit. If that is not the case, we request that the approval to withdraw from the site plan control agreement be conditional on the new building permit being amended or revoked and reissued to include these conditions and recommendations. Examples of the conditions and recommendations I'm referring to would be the Quinty conservation conditions regarding manure management, some very specific supervised construction elements, plus the need for a site characterization study, items that they stated were not dependent on barn size or livestock unit numbers. Also, XCG Consulting made recommendations regarding soil testing and hydraulic conductivity in spreading areas as well as near the manure storage tanks. These are extremely important considerations that contribute to the protection of the health and safety of the community. Earlier today, we sent you a schedule of all the experts' recommendations as well as the conditions that were part of the site plan control agreement. All of those apply to the new project. And thirdly, it is in everyone's interest to avoid situations where council is in a legal battle with the members of the community over a development of any kind. The community was and still is angry that council did not use its discretion for the betterment of the community despite widespread public concern and opposition to this development. Giving the public the opportunity to review and or to provide input to council on proposed developments is at the discretion of council. We call on you to relinquish that discretion and enact a bylaw or take whatever action is necessary to make sure that in the future, at a bare minimum, the municipality is required to provide public notification and allow a reasonable period of consultation for any project that poses a risk to the health and safety, the environment or lifestyle of its residents, especially in environmentally sensitive locations such as this one. We look forward to the opportunity of working together with you on this and other important issues in the future. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Mark? Jason or anybody want to go ahead, John. Yes, thank you. Um, Mark, I think you're, uh, you're aware of the, uh, the fact that not only has the, uh, the number of sows been, been reduced, um, but the, uh, the wieners are no longer, in my understanding anyway, going to be uh, 
present on the on the site um, for any length of time and also the 150 uh, beef cattle are being removed so the, the total impact of that I, I took the time to uh, um, to ask Peter Doris uh, you can remember originally uh, he said that that the original application was equivalent in size to about a a largest dairy farm of about 140 uh, cattle and I think you probably noted in uh, in the uh, agenda package that that now we're looking at an operation equivalent to about 80 dairy cattle so that's that's not a marginal reduction um, it's now 57 percent of the size of the original proposal in other words it's, it's down to almost half what was there before and I'm not minimizing the risk that there is still a risk but it, that's a considerable reduction in risk. I think that's something that we have to have to be clear on here. Um, and, and uh, you know, in terms of, of reducing risk, kudos to your group uh, who raised a lot of issues that uh, um, allow some clarification on, on the nature of that risk. Um, but you've been very successful, uh, I think, from your standpoint, in, in reducing the, uh, the livestock units to, to almost half what was originally there. The problem being, of course, and, and as you're, you're pointing out, now that that operation doesn't require site plan control, we've lost our, our ability uh, to have conditions on that project. Um, the Conservation Authority conditions you mentioned, the XCG conditions, uh, and whatever well else we wanted to uh, impose, um, we no longer have a means to do that. And, and I would ask, uh, uh, subsequent to your response to my statement, Mark, to get a legal opinion on whether we can attach those kind of conditions, which we could do with a site plan agreement, to a building permit. But I'll give you a chance to uh, respond to my comments, Mark. Well, I appreciate that the, the size is reduced. The sort of underlying concern is, is certainly connected to the size of the operation and the number of livestock units, but it is also connected to geography. And the location of this on potentially still karst topography and uh, the potential drainage into the lake or into um, people's downstream wells is still very much there. And the issue with that um, uh, being linked to the karst possibility is is very very uh, significant um, because it is so difficult to predict what's going to happen to groundwater if it does get into car into karst or fractured limestone and if it's contaminated or has you know has um, ant um, bacteria in it for example it can go a, a myriad of directions and be um, very, very damaging to those downstream wells. And so um, I appreciate your offer of trying to find out whether or not you can attach some of those conditions to uh, a, a building permit approval because those things are very much still very real risks for people living in that area. Go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah and I appreciate there's still a risk in, in, in terms of cars. I think uh, OMAFRA still has some input uh, in, in regard to the construction of the buildings and the manure tank if karst is, is uncovered. However, I'm not certain about that. But I, I would uh, um, ask for an opinion, I guess, from uh, either Jason or, or Tony Fleming on the uh, legality or the possibility of attaching um, environmental conditions such as we had with the site plan control agreement uh, to a building permit. Hey, we're going to go to Wenda next year first. She had her hand up. Go ahead, Wenda. Uh, well, I'm. I, question though. I, I'm asking Tony or or Jason to. Oh, sorry. I like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. I'll just hold on there for a second. Um, Tony, you there or um, Jason? Sorry, John. Through through your worship, I uh, j simply for the fact that uh, Mr. Fleming has joined us and he's our township solicitor. I I do deem it best that he answer this question. Uh, right, thank right. you. Thank you. And through you, your worship, uh, I, I could certainly provide counsel with that opinion if, if you'd uh, direct me to do so. Um, the, 
One of the difficulties is uh, I'm not sure whether a building permit for the smaller facility has already been issued or not. And that certainly would have an impact on whether council has the ability to add any conditions, even if I could figure out whether there was a legal mechanism for council to do so. Is that okay, John? Well, I guess the, the question then is, has the building permit been issued? And uh, Jake could possibly answer that. Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, it's, it was issued uh, like January 12th under normal permit issuing processes. Um, I, conditions are generally something that, that council does. Um, uh, council doesn't issue permits, I issue permits, and uh, I'm not um, the legal authority for, I mean, I don't have any authority to put special conditions upon a building permit. That's what council and Jason do. Okay, go ahead, John. So we don't actually have that opportunity then. Uh, Jake has uh, has issued the building permit, uh, I assume because the, the application for the permit was in order. Um, so at this point, uh, whatever leverage we have in that regard does not exist. So we're at the, at the stage where um, we would have to approach Mark Slack and uh, negotiate uh, something with him to uh, at least observe the, uh, the conditions that we had previously in the site plan agreement. That's all I'll say for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Wenda. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. Okay. A couple of things. Um, sort of uh, rounding back to John's question. Um, so I'm going to direct just your worship to Jason, if I could. Um, we, I assume there was some discussion with uh, Mr. Slack uh, regarding uh, what he was planning to do uh, with the uh, revocation of the site plan control agreement and replacement uh, with just this lesser uh, uh, livestock units. Um, during the course of those discussions, I don't know if you have the privilege to share that with us tonight, but um, was there, would there not have been conversation dealing with every, uh, the things, the concerns that CCCE and Council and XCG and Quinty Conservation Authority had with the previous site plan control agreement and the intention there to see that as for going forward with his uh, lesser operation that he would take into consideration um, these um, issues that were brought forward um, over the past almost nine months now. What, did that discussion take place? And if so, are you uh, privileged to share that with us? Jason. Through, through you, your worship, um, just for everyone's sake, I wanna confirm that one of the agenda items further on through the delegation section of tonight's agenda is a, is a staff report that speaks to um, the request of Slack Family Farms to revoke from the site plan control agreement. Um, I would also just mention at that time, I, although that report is authored under my name, uh, we had direct input from our legal uh, representative, Mr. Tony Fleming, Chief Building Official Jake Detler uh, and CAO Brian Brooks. And we're all happy to answer questions that may stem out of that uh, of that report. So I, I'm not saying that I don't want to answer your question at this time, Councillor Lalonde. I just want to point out the fact that there may be some questions uh, answered in, in that. To the, to the specifics of the intent behind Mr. Slack in reducing the barn size and nutrient unit size, I can't speak to. That, that is obviously uh, uh, something that the applicant can speak to only as it is his project uh, and his construction. But I believe um, from a municipal perspective uh, in, in commencing the review and, and sort of spearheading that review, I would believe that there were significant consideration given to what the applicant was required to complete in the processing uh, of the years to follow uh, through that site plan control agreement, as well as 
the ongoing court proceedings um, that were active uh, in their consideration to downsize the operation and facilitate construction. Um, but any further detail to that would need to be answered directly by the applicant. Thank you. Hey, my, Go ahead, Linda, sure. Yeah, I, and I, I did have to uh, quickly. Uh, so Mark has raised uh, an issue about the financial compensation for the legal fees. Um, and I just wonder if Ryan can speak to that or perhaps Tony, I don't know. Um, that's certainly now that the uh, the building permit's been issued, um, we can't obviously address Mark's concerns in that regard, but I, I guess I would ask for an update um, about the legal fees that were attached to the site plan control agreement. Sure, so there, Your Worship, there's, there's a double layer to that. Uh, we asked our Treasury Department to pull invoices today um, that would be directly reflected as well as the bills um, that are that are borne back to the applicant as part of this application. Um, so a summary of expenses that have gone through this file, which I'm happy to share at the request of Reeve Smith. He asked me this morning what those costs were and to have those prepared for this evening. Um, we essentially have uh, two uh, Cunningham Swan invoices that, that are on record. Uh, the first is the registration of the agreement, et cetera, which is obviously a, um, an expense borne to the applicant uh, based on the on the costs of the registration that's as part of site plan. Um, the second was, uh, was a summary of expenses listed with the May 29th information session on site plan approval, which in the definition of staff, we believe that that was put on as an education session, not only for one site plan application, but all site plan applications and likewise do not pertain to that application. So it's opinion of our staff that those costs should not be borne by the applicant uh, for one specific file. Um, we have two additional invoices over and above that. Um, they are, uh, one is the XCG $1,800 cost that was recommended by council to have a third party peer review. Um, this was in addition to the application and after the application was complete. Again, this was in the absence of having specialized staff in here for those reviews and therefore was done to ensure that um, there was no, you know, at fault issues that were remained from that application, as well as the $500 review that we had, um, that we had XCG complete with regards to the hydrogeology. Um, after management and discussion, we believe that those are costs borne by our planning department. Um, the, it wasn't that these uh, services were not provided as part of the application, but they were done in order to protect, uh, you know, the, the approval from our municipality and therefore should not be passed off to the applicant as well. Um, further on to that, the other costs that were incurred as part of this, which speaking to the legal processes, um, you know, again, speaking uh, directly from my position, um, the challenge legally was done on the basis of challenging council's procedure um, or whether we had the ability and did we use the right discretion in making that decision. The legal proceedings associated towards that are actually towards council and their actions and not necessarily the approval of the application. Again, I believe that it would be unreasonable to bore, uh, have those costs borne back onto the applicant as the actual legal proceedings were actually challenging council's uh, ability to make decision or discretion um, that they used in making that decision. So that's a summary of expenses, uh, all summary expenses that are eligible and are part of the application solely, we believe are, are billed back to the applicant, um, but the ones that are, you know, as a result of, uh, you know, public education or public information or reassuring the third handy, uh, third hand peer reviews, um, it's our opinion that those, those fees should not be borne back to an applicant as we have not and do not usually do that uh, on previous applications and, and don't intend whenever we have um, you know, any, any fees associated with the planning application or building permits, um, that's essentially what they're there for, is for the municipality to, um, you know, to, to deal with the applications and approve permits as, as such. Thank you. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I have to, I do have to question that. Would, would that. would those decisions not have come to council to make as opposed to staff? 
whether or not these costs will be incurred by the uh, the township, the the taxpayer, the ratepayer, versus the uh, proponent, Ms. Uh, Slack Farms. Well, the applicant, not the, the legal fees, as far as the the largest component, which I believe to be the CCE costs borne um, as part of the legal, we don't even have those fees yet, so they're not even. Oh. Able, so, but the the ones that are in. Um, are the XCG reports, which council actually approved those expenses um, as, as getting third party peer reviews um, for documents that were already submitted by the applicant. And the other ones, uh, the, the original one, the registration is borne back to the applicant. And, and, and I don't know that we have the ability to, to charge any of the additional fees, council of land, aside from any of the legal fees, but I would you know, I would look to our solicitor later on as part of the review to, to have him comment on the reasonableness of, of uh, having those costs borne to the applicant based on the fact that they were challenging our proceedings and were not necessarily as a result of the applicant's approval. Okay, Linda. Okay, uh, yeah, and the final thing, um, I just need clarification uh, about the livestock um, the units um, dropping by half. I, I know they're dropping by half based on what his original plan was for this farm, but how are they going to compare to what has been happening on that farm for the last, I'm going to say 14 years, but it could be more or less. He's had cattle on that land. He's been spreading manure on that land uh, of, I think, 150 cows that he's actually cattle that he's taking off that land so how does that factor into the livestock units because um, John you mentioned it's it's going to be now equivalent to 80 cattle um, where he's had I believe 150 on there for 14 years so would it not be even less than that but have I got this wrong Go ahead, John. Yeah, um, uh, nutrient units is actually the correct term, and it's a way of comparing apples and oranges because a beef cow does not put out as much manure as a dairy cow does not puts out more manure than a pig, blah, 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 etc. So I think um, when the calculations have been done uh, by removing 150 beef stalkers, and they weren't even cows, they're feeder cattle, so smaller manure output, um, you remove those, you diminish the number of sows, you reduce the duration of time that the piglets are there, you balance all that out, and the equivalent would be about 57% of the nutrient of the manure output uh, that there was from the previous proposal. That's what it comes down to. Okay, thank you. I just, uh, the numbers weren't, they, they didn't make sense to me. Thanks. Hey, Jason, did you want us? Well, you or Jake were both on there, are you? I guess nothing. Yep. Through you, Deputy Reeve Wise said it more elegantly as I than I. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, any more questions or comments from anybody? Mark, you want? Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I was just uh, going to make the motion to receive. Okay, we have a motion to receive the report. Looking for a seconder. Second by Debbie. All in favor of the motion? Motion to carry unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Christina, we got to wait a minute. Can we move forward? Uh, just one moment. Okay, let me know. Okay, you're clear. Okay, we'll go on to uh, number eight here. At, uh, to um, manager and planning, Deputy Clerk Sands, a letter from Slack Farm requesting acknowledgement of withdrawal to a site plan agreement pertaining to the SP04 2019 Slack Farm due to a change in proposed development. Thank go you, ahead. your thank you, your worship. Much appreciated. Um, everyone's well aware of what this report entails through the delegations in which we've heard already tonight. 
Um, but I do want to take the time to overview it um, and answer any questions that you may have following up uh, upon receipt. I also want to mention that uh, Chief Building Official Detler, uh, CAO Brooks, and Legal Counsel Mr. Fleming are on tonight's call and, and by all means able to assist in uh, their specific facets as it relates to this application. But I will provide the overview and initial commentary speaking to the request by Mr. Slack uh, on behalf of Slack Family Farms in a letter in which the municipality received on January 12th seeking to revoke the existing building permit application as well as revoke the existing uh, site plan control agreement that uh, Mr. Slack entered into with the township on May 19th, 2020 to facilitate the development of a 2,870 square meter uh, livestock facility on the subject property on Waddell Road. So um, the applicant's desire to revoke that agreement is here in front of council um, with staff's recommendation to revoke that agreement uh, and terminate it effectively. Um, should council direct staff to continue with its recommendation, Mr. Uh, Fleming and staff would remove that agreement from title, uh, thereby removing and terminating it in its entirety, so that in the case that the applicant wishes to expand the livestock facility in the future beyond what is contained within the building permit that CBO Detler has issued, um, additional approvals and public processes would be applicable uh, through the consideration of council, similar to the site plan control exercise that we've completed to date. Um, with respect to the changes, the current proposal, or sorry, my apologies, the former proposal was a 2,870 square meter livestock facility with a 5,000 uh, cubic meter pit um, to accommodate a total of 625 sows 600 wieners and maintain the existing 150 beef feeders that are on site. All that cumulatively equates to a 267 nutrient unit count. Um, and why that's applicable um, from a nutrient unit perspective, as Deputy Revise has already alluded to, there's differing degrees of nutrient unit count associated with different type of livestock. So the 50 beef the 150, sorry, beef feeders that are on site currently equate to 50 nutrient units, um, whereas the sows and the wieners each equate to a different level of nutrient units than those beef cattle. So the proposed operation that is being um, constructed through the, the reissuance of a, a new building permit is for the creation of a barn that would house a total of 499 sows zero wieners, as well as necessitate the owner to remove the 150 beef feeders from that parcel prior to the occupancy of that um, sow barn. That smaller barn then comes in at a total nutrient count of 142 nutrient units, which is in our outdated, in our bylaw, outdated livestock, intensive livestock bylaw, equating to 99 livestock units under the 100 unit threshold that triggers site plan control. Um, so all this being said is the smaller operation that is being proposed um, by Slack Family Farms to 499 sows stays under the site plan requirement and avoids its necessity. <coughs> As Deputy Reeve Wise already mentioned, it's very similar to an 80 cattle operation, beet dairy cattle operation that you would see throughout our, our rural landscape. Um, with respect to the building permit issuance um, and any of the specifics around that, I would defer to my colleague CBO Detler. With respect to our financial considerations of the ongoing court proceeding, as well as how and, wit and what fees the applicant may be required to complete and pay to the municipality, CAO Brooks can most definitely assist. And regarding the court proceeding, 
in, in, as a whole with a rescinded or, or a terminated site plan control application um, that is currently being challenged in the court system. Uh, our solicitor, Mr. Fleming, is, is here to answer those questions. So um, I leave that with you as an overview and reiterate that the recommendation before you for consideration tonight by staff is that you direct staff and management specifically to terminate the agreement um, and remove that title, uh, site plan control agreement from title, which would then in the future necessitate further approvals should the applicant desire to expand their operation at that time. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Any questions for Jason or do you want to uh, put a question to any of go, um, go ahead, John. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Jason, um, our, our, as you mentioned, our, our existing uh, intensive livestock bylaw um, is outdated. It uses uh, um, a now outmoded uh, mathematical mechanism for calculating uh, uh, nutrient units. Um, and clearly the, the barn that's being constructed and the manure pit um, would still allow for expansion as uh, James uh, alluded to earlier in the uh, three minute delegation. Um, would it be feasible to uh, redraft that bylaw, uh, leaving out sections that are, are already covered by the uh, Nutrient Management Act, um, but retaining our requirement for a site plan control uh, agreement and a, a hydro G study and whatever else we thought um, we should put in there uh, to, as a sort of a, a supplement to the Nutrient Management Act. Would you, uh, would you think that we could do that? Um, or, uh, and maybe Tony could weigh in on this as well. Um, do we really have any legal foundation to require a, a farm operation um, to, uh, to uh, conform to a site plan control agreement or any other conditions that are above and beyond what the Nutrient Management Act already requires? Through you, Your Worship, I, Go ahead. I don't mind starting with Tony joining following. Um, my first comment was would be to Deputy Reeve Wise's comment, um, the Nutrient Management Act is clear in that any lower municipal regulation uh, in terms of order may only exist should it not be covered within the Nutrient Management Act. So any bylaw that we propose to enact uh, or regulate in our municipality ought to give consideration to whether or not legally it's not overstepping our requirements or abilities to regulate with respect to that Nutrient Management Act. Um, the existing site plan control bylaw, which was brought into effect in 2000, and the intensive livestock bylaw, which was brought into effect in 2001, um, are approximately 20 years old, both uh, currently, and it is um, most definitely something that I want to see updated and I plan to update um, in moving forward into the near future. Um, it is not something that I have done or looked at in great detail to date. Um, currently working on the five-year official plan update as it's to be completed in 2021 or no long, no later. So this is most definitely something that staff as well as our um, legal solicitor will be working on and if we don't have an answer for that tonight it uh, will be something you see in the future through an update. Thank you. Do you have something? Oh sorry that's that window. Anybody else? Jake do you want to step in on this? Okay when did you have something? No no I was just gonna oh, yeah, um, just kind of mention that uh, yeah, my world is pretty simple. Um, if he meets all the applicable laws, I issue the permit. If he doesn't meet all the applicable laws, I don't issue a permit. Um, yeah, um, I don't have the ability to say to a person, yeah, I, 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 here's your permit for a garage, but the siding needs to be green because I think it would be a, a, a good color for a garage, right? So um, uh, I, I, I don't have, I need, I need laws. Um, to 
to pass it to Jason so that you and Jason can handle um, all of these nuances through a planning agreement. And when he um, uh, lowered the livestock unit down to 99, that left him in a spot where the laws were clear. Um, he just had to meet the zoning bylaw. Um, he was, you know, not required um, to go through the entire process that he just went through um, um, in the in the spring last year. Um, that's all I was going to add. So. Okay, good enough. Brian, do you have anything to say, or Tony? Go ahead, Brenda. Okay. Um, uh, kind of losing my train of thought here. Lots to think about. Um, I guess what I'm uh, two things that I'm curious about. Uh, one is um, we don't know very much, or we haven't talked a lot about the existing farm, the one that was there prior to, you know, last spring. Um, we don't know what's been happening there uh, too much, other than there's 150 beef. Uh, that are going to be, what did you call them, stalkers, um, that are going to be removed from there. So I, I'd like, I guess, a little um, a vision maybe of when he, let's just say he moves forward with this new uh, 499 sows and um, <coughs> is, does, do we have a sense that what he's planning to do there is going to be more environmentally conscious than what he has there already. Um, there's been some statement that what he's proposing to do is gonna be equal to 50, 80 um, beef, uh, or he had 150 on there before. Um, dairy. Pardon me? It's gonna be equivalent to- Oh, the difference of dairy. Okay, thank you. Um, so does anyone have a sense of, of the environmental impact in, aside from the livestock units and the nutrient unit count? Um, the production and the building and the pit and everything, is it going to be safer? I guess that's my big question. Is it going to be safer than what's already there? Through, through your worship, my, my first comment to that, um, not getting into any of the detail or minutia around nutrient units or, um, you know, beef, dairy, sows, any of that detail. Um, my, my first comment would be the new construction that's being proposed in 2021 has an entirely different set of approval process in place and in effect than what you see on site on any operation that was constructed previously. So the existing beef operation that's on site has, for example, a yard and a barn and the cattle are permitted to be exterior to that barn. There's no manure pit. Uh, and in proximity, speaking proximity or geographic distances, it is most definitely closer to significant water bodies such as Beaver Lake. It's significantly closer to the increased density of Aaronsville itself. Uh, and from a planning perspective, most, li most likely would fail to comply to the standards prescribed in the township zoning bylaw to date. All that being said, the proposed new operation, sow operation fronting um, in closer proximity, I should say, to Waddell Road is proposed to be supported with a engineered sewage pit that'll collect all the sewage as opposed to uh, the, the other, the former. Um, the barn construction will be reviewed, will be engineered and reviewed in conformance with the newest Ontario building code. The OMAFRA requirements and the site characterization requirements that are instilled on any farmer in 2021 um, require significant geotechnical work, um, hydraulic connectivity studying, um, as well as a professional engineer certifying that the characterization of that site can accommodate that build. Um, I'm not going to say with 100% confidence, but I would very highly suspect that that op existing beef operation that's on site 
did not go through the, the rigor of approvals that this new build will be experiencing. So um, I just point that out because there um, is most definitely a change in the time from a legislative perspective from what's on site currently to what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Else? You have something, Doug? Yeah, Go I ahead. do. To be honest with you, I think we're spinning our wheels a little bit here. Most of the questions that are being asked right now should have been asked last spring. It's too late for us to ask them now. We don't have, I don't believe the authority to, to go back retroactively and do that. Uh, I would like to hear Tony, what Tony has to say on it, but I doubt if we can change that, uh, uh, anything that's already been issued or whatever. The unfortunate part here is with the number of units uh, going down, we've now lost what little bit of control we did have with the site plan agreement. And I don't believe that there's anything we can do about it, but I would certainly be interested in hearing Tony say if he thinks differently. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you, and through you, your worship. Um, I think Councillor Davidson, Davidson has hit it on the head. You, you as a council don't have the legal authority to regulate the new proposal for the smaller barn through site plan. It doesn't meet your site plan control bylaw threshold. So what you have in front of you tonight is a request by the applicant for council to revoke the site plan approval that is, is already been given. The important thing for council to appreciate is, uh, as Mr. Dettler indicated, the building permit for the smaller barn has been issued. The permit under the building code for the larger barn has been revoked. So right now the owner has the legal right to build the smaller barn. If council does not accept his request to revoke the site plan control agreement, that agreement stays on title and tomorrow he can come in, ask council for another building permit to build the bigger barn and Mr. Detler will have to issue that permit for the bigger barn because it meets all applicable laws. Now the site plan control agreement requires some monitoring and some other characterization study. That's true, but he will be entitled legally to the, the larger barn and a subject to the site plan control agreement conditions. Council wouldn't have any say in that either. So the fact that you have now issued the smaller permit you have a request from the owner to re revoke that site plan control agreement. It's certainly my recommendation to council that you do revoke that agreement because as Mr. Sands indicated earlier, revocation of that agreement and removing it from title means without question, if they want to increase the number of sows, add wieners, whatever, on that site, that brings it right back to council and then you get to reopen the discussion from square one and do a site plan control agreement. And it may look nothing like the site plan control agreement you have on title today. Depends what the studies look like, depends on what the conditions are and what uh, conditions council wants to include. Thank you, Tony. You okay with that, Doug? Yeah, okay. that's just about what I thought. Okay, any other questions or comments on this? Go ahead, John. Yes, in, in regard to, uh, to the removal of the existing beef operation, um, I think it's important to, to think back uh, on the, uh, the comments that uh, Eric Appadale, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, um, the nutrient management consultant that was retained by uh, CCCE, um, his main environmental concern, if I recall correctly, was with that cattle operation. As Jason pointed out, um, I guess it's kind of been grandfathered in. It's far too close to the village. Um, uh, there's no proper manure storage there. The cattle roam at large virtually. Um, I'll express no concerns about the, the hog part of the uh, operation, uh, the larger operation that was previously proposed. So um, addressing when is sort of fundamental question is, will this be potentially a less environmentally risky operation 
at least from that standpoint, I think we can say with certainty it will be a less risky operation, getting those cattle out of there. Um, and as Jason pointed out, um, th this is an expansion of, of uh, Mr. Slack's overall operation. And as such, he will still be subject to OMAFRA nutrient management type regulations. At least I believe that is the case. All that being said, what makes an operation safe is a responsible operator. A, a reckless operator who spreads any amount of manure, whether it's from four or 500 sows or from 10, spreading manure at the wrong time in the wrong place will create an environmental risk. And we, we have to trust one another in a, an open society in, in all kinds of ways that we will not put our neighbors at risk. So we, we can talk about um, uh, studies and sizing and distance separation and everything else. The ball is definitely in Mr. Slack's court when it comes to spreading that manure and making sure that, that his operation is environmentally sound, no matter if he's got 50 sows or, or 1,500 sows. And that's just a matter of, uh, of uh, seeing what happens there. And unfortunately, one of our, our main mechanisms was going to be a baseline water quality study of adjacent private wells. I think that was one of the conditions in the Quinty Conservation uh, um, commentary on the operation. We no longer have that. So it's kind of a, a mixed blessing having this operation reduced to 57% of its previous size and getting the cattle out there, out of there, that's a big plus. The downside is some of the monitoring controls to make sure that the, the concerns about groundwater and runoff that were in place before no longer are, at least as far as I understand it. I'm not sure what OMAFRA requires in that regard, and I'd like to find that out. So I'll just leave it at that, thank you. Okay, any more questions or comments? If not, we have a recommendation in front of us. I'll read the recommendation. The yeah, Delta Receive. Oh, sorry. Sorry, oh, sorry. Oh. Just as part of the recommendation, uh, to Councillor Land's point earlier, if there is an appetite from Council to pursue costs, I would like to ensure that Council gives that consideration, at least through discussion with, uh, with Tony Fleming, as part of the resolution this evening, because my expectation is that if council wishes to pursue costs, that that would also be an amendment to the resolution that's, uh, that's attached to tonight's council agenda. Are you talking more costs than, uh, than what you sort of come well, up with? It, well, if, if you essentially remove the agreement from title, it's expected that if the council were to pursue costs, that they would want those costs paid before we would remove from title. So yes, there's approximately, accumulatively, there's about $4,300 in total invoices, um, 1,500 of that being towards the information session, and 2,300 of it um, being the costs of the XCG reports. So it's important for, for us to receive direction as to when those invoices come in, who's responsible to pay them, um, because if there was a discussion on court costs, um, those costs are still not known yet, as it's, uh, you know, the the, request to actually uh, halt proceedings, if you will, um, is, is still yet to be completed following the action this evening. Okay. Any, any comments on this? Go ahead, Kevin. Well, I, uh, I'm not clear as, as to everything Brian's referring to there, but I think a lot of it is, uh, it's cost borne by the municipality and it's some of those I know that, that the council had put forth that we wanted just to check things out. Um, so I'm suggesting that uh, that is borne by the municipality as it would be if somebody, you know, uh, you put a building permit in for a house that's 3,500 square feet, then you come back to a township and say, no, I wanna change that. I only wanna build a 1,600 square foot home. There's, there's costs associated there as well, maybe, but it's the right of that person to change their mind. And I, I think the costs that have been borne, other than the, uh, the lawyer's costs, um, that should be picked up by the municipality and, and borne by the municipality. As far as the lawyer costs and such, 
uh, I feel that the, the Slack Farm, they are just a third person in on that, quite frankly. Um, that they didn't really, they're not the ones that instigated um, any lawyer fees to, to, uh, to go with that. That came from CCCE. And uh, I think those, those costs should be borne by uh, CCCE, their costs, and the municipality. Uh, it's cost of doing business. Does the, if anybody knows here, does the CCCE expect um, Slack to pay for our, about the illegal meeting of that? Is, is that part of their um, proposal or not? Anybody know? Anybody help me here? You're in that, Brian? Your, your Worship, I, I would make from the assumption earlier in the presentation that when they assumed legal costs, that they were also including the legal costs associated with uh, with that challenge. That was my assumption. Um, I have not got written or, or verbal confirmation on that, but my assumption was, and especially even with Councillor Lalanne's response, my assumption was that those costs were part of that equation. If I may, just very quickly, just give Council just a quick run rundown. There was the $1,500 from the open session where we had the site plan that we basically had Peter Doris, uh, Tony Fleming, um, Mark Boone of Quinney Conservation, where we had the public information session. Um, based on the fact that that was meant to be a site plan approval, not, not for one application, but an education session entirely, um, you know, it's very difficult. And, and I would, my assumption is that council will direct us on this. You know, it would be unfair to put that full cost back on a single applicant based on the fact that we wanted it to be broad in scope in an education session. Um, the other two were XCG reports, which council actually by motion endorse those. If council wishes us to pursue those, we would like direction. They were 1800 and 500, which is 23. And the actual registration costs of the agreement on title was actually under $500. So that's essentially the breakdown of the expenses that are in our office at present. And I just want council to be aware of the number of that expense. And then, of course, there's the costs associated with the legal challenge um, from CCCE to the municipality on the process or the discretion of the decision making. So, so that's a, essentially a summary of costs that we have in our office now. Okay, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Mr. Fleming, a challenge there, the, um, the legal fee there, when they were um, saying the municipality did something wrong, do you feel that... Uh, um, the cost between Mr. Slack and the township, that they should be a part of that? Through you, Your Worship. I don't know how the township could make a, a sustainable argument to Slack Family Farms that it should bear the township's cost to defend a legal action that, other than being the applicant, they had nothing to do with it. I mean, if you'll recall, Slack Family Farms wasn't even named by Triple C E in the application. Uh, they only knew about it because the township provided them information that there had been a challenge to the site plan approval process. And the, the challenge was not that um, Slack Family Farms had inappropriately done anything. <laughs> The entire basis of the challenge was that council had, among other things, you know, processed the application improperly, held an illegal meeting, which I've seen absolutely no evidence of. You know, so all of the all of the challenge that was brought to the court was that council had done something wrong, not that Slack Family Farms had done something wrong. So my view. Uh, as a matter of, of legal principle, it would be almost impossible to suggest to Slack Family Farms that they're somehow responsible for the township's legal costs related to the application. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I, really, I think that there's only a small amount here that's attributable to Slack, and that's the uh, XCGE third party reviews and the cost of registration registering that on title. Other than that, the rest of the cost, I believe, is the municipalities. So I think we should be going after what is directly theirs, those those two things, that $2,300 or whatever it was there that Brian mentioned, 
but I think that's it. Uh, the, and that was directly attributable to the Slack firms. Go ahead, John. Yes, thank you. Um, I I can't even see a case for for uh, a charging Slack for the uh, XCGE study. Um, he was not legally required to do any more than he did, which was to uh, apply for a building permit and to go through the uh, Nutrient Management Act process with OMAFRA and, uh, and any other government agency that he was obliged to uh, run his plans by. Um, it was actually me that, that pushed for an XCG study in response to public concern. And I think it's important that we did that, but Mark Slack has, did not apply for that, uh, that study. He'd done his studies, regardless of whether or not uh, um, the public or anyone on council thinks those studies were adequate. Those studies were judged to be adequate by the bodies that are legally charged with evaluating them, namely OMAFRA, uh, Ministry of the Environment, and, and the other agencies that, that uh, approved them. His, his only responsibility was to have his hydrogeologist and his engineers um, come up uh, with, with studies and uh, information to satisfy the Nutrient Management Act. It was council that took it upon themselves to uh, pay for that study that basically reviewed the studies that he had provided. I don't see him as being obligated to pay for any more uh, than his, uh, his application for his building permit, um, for registering the site plan agreement on title, uh, and really that's it. I, I, I'd be interested to hear what uh, Tony's response to that would be in terms of the XCG uh, report that, uh, that we requested. Through you, Your Worship, uh, I, I would agree with Deputy Reeve Wise. It would be difficult to make uh, a case that Slack Family Farms is obliged under the site plan agreement to pay for that XCG report primarily because council had already approved the site plan and we'd entered into the agreement before the XCG report was required by or requested by council. So it, it wasn't a condition of the site plan control agreement. And if you look at um, the site plan control agreement, sections 15, 16, and 17 speak to your ability as a municipality to seek costs from the applicant, and it's conditioned on those costs that are necessary to process the application, approve the drawings, and enter into the site plan control agreement. So with respect to the XCG report, council had already decided to enter into the site plan control agreement and approved that agreement prior to getting that report. So I, I don't believe that you have the legal authority under the agreement to seek re uh, reimbursement for the cost of that study. Go ahead, Jason. And through you, Your Worship, just to further the commentary from Mr. Fleming for clarity to all, not only was the site plan control agreement already completed, approved, and registered on title when the municipality took it upon themselves to have XCG complete the peer review, the XCG peer review work was largely completed to look at the hydrogeological considerations of the proposal. And the hydrogeology component of the proposal was previously peer reviewed by Mark Boone at Quinney Conservation. So through the processing of the application, before staff ever got to the council, to council seeking approval with the recommendation to enter into the site plan control agreement, Quinney Conservation approved the Hydro-G study. Um, the applicant, Mark Slack, directly was billed for the peer review work associated with the Hydro-G studies completed by Mark Boone at Quinney Conservation. So that was always directly invoiced to the applicant. Whereas in, in my view, uh, as staff, the, the work and the hydrogeological further assessment by XCG was completed to re-review already completed hydrogeology work above and beyond 
what a normal um, or, or average applicant may be subjected to through site plan control. Thanks. Great, thank you. So I guess if there's, if there's any more questions or, go ahead, John. Yeah, just, just one more thing. We, we don't know what, uh, what our costs are going to be, uh, legal costs are going to be uh, uh, in engaging uh, Cunningham Swan, uh, for whom Tony works, um, uh, to deal with the, uh, the application uh, for an injunction that uh, CCE has, has put forward. And I'm just wondering um, if Tony could give us some idea of uh, um, what is likely to happen to that case now and, and who is responsible for costs um, in different scenarios going forward in that case. Uh, through you, Your Worship, what I suspect will happen now, and I've already made this request to the CCCE folks, is I've requested that they uh, abandon or withdraw their application on the basis that it's now moot, because uh, assuming the council decides tonight to withdraw or revoke its approval for the site plan, the the thing that they were challenging no longer exists so the basis for their legal challenge will have evaporated and there's no reason for that to go forward it's difficult to suggest that we the township would only consent to a withdrawal if they paid some portion of the costs because at, at this point, they'll argue that the application was absolutely legitimate based on their need to challenge your earlier decision. And it's only because Slack Family Farms has withdrawn uh, its application for site plan approval that their application isn't going forward and that's through no fault of their own. They're not entirely wrong that it's through no fault of their own that the application won't go ahead. In order to argue for costs, we'd effectively have to argue that the application itself had no merit, which means I would need affidavit evidence and you're effectively trying to argue the merits of the application without actually arguing the merits of the application just to get a cost award. I don't believe that a, a judge would want to engage in that exercise. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate that costs have been incurred I've done my best throughout to try and keep costs as low as possible because we were in such an early stage. Um, but there, there's no question there will be costs that the township will see. I hope that answers your question, Councillor. Yes, it does, thank you. So what I take away from that is that we'll pay you and they will pay Mr. Gillespie. <laughs> thank you. Okay, before we move on here, we've had some different views of um, whether we're going to build slack with um, some bills or not, and I think Deputy Rewise said he didn't think we would have to build with anything. So, what I mean, what's council wishes here before we get into this motion? Go ahead, John. Well, I, I didn't say we wouldn't have to build for anything. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, with some, any, yeah, anything right. that is is normal in his yeah. in in the township application yeah. procedure, um, he, he's obliged to pay. Uh, anything above and beyond that, uh, I can't see the the case being made for it, as, as Tony has indicated. So uh, I would, I would, uh, I would move that uh, uh, we um, we agree to the recommendation, which is to uh, withdraw the uh, existing site plan agreement, and that that uh, the normal procedure for for billing an applicant uh, for any any costs incurred uh, by the township uh, uh, that we proceed with that as as we normally would. Um, and to be specific, uh, I, I can't see uh, Slack Family Farms being responsible for the XCG e study or the uh, the costs of having uh, um, experts at the, at our public information meeting, which was um, something that Mr. Slack was not legally required to uh, uh, to participate in or or to to bring forward his own experts or anything like that. That that was a public service by the township in response to legitimate public concern. That was a that was a motion. That was it was a verbose yeah. motion. This basically boiled down okay. to back in there. Can I, can I call for a recorded vote, Reeve Smith? Yes. Okay. We got a seconder first. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kevin, seconder. 
we have any more discussion here first on this? Any more discussion? Okay, we're going to have a recorded vote. To... Uh, Wenda's on there, Eric. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Wenda. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think this has been a really good discussion. Uh, I thank CCE for CCCE for bringing it up for discussion. Thanks, Brian, for putting it on the table. And I was prepared to actually vote against the idea that uh, I was in favor of charging them some money. Um, but after this full body discussion, I'm very comfortable to uh, uh, agree with the motion. I was going to say, if it didn't, all you had to do was vote against it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, we start with a court vote. Uh, do you want to list Brian or do you want to just go across the camera? Your Worship, if I may, I'd just like to do it in the order to which I'm looking at. Okay. Um, it's uh, normally not the round table order, but it's uh, it leaves the reeve right. uh, as the last to vote. Okay. Um, first in my screen is Councillor Milligan. It's in favor. Councillor Lalande. Yes. In favor. Deputy Reeve Wise. Yes. Councillor Thompson. Yes. Councillor Richmond. Yes. Councillor Davison. Yes. And Reeve Smith. Yes. Your Worship, the motion is unanimous. Okay, thank you. We will move on now to the Christina Bouchard, the December 2020 Stone Mills Township Accounts Payable. Need a motion, any questions for Christina? No. Christina, do you have anything to say? No. Nope. Okay, any So questions? moved. So moved by David, second by Sherry. All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, Chief Building Official Dettler update on oper operation restrictions of the Stone Mills Recreation Center. Go ahead, Jake. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, not really a uh, report that I wanted to bring to council. Um, um, when the first sort of movement to the gray zone happened uh, before Christmas, um, we were hoping to get back on, on January 24th and, um, and um, I'm, you know, since I wrote this report on Thursday, um, you know, our, our local KFLNA uh, caseload has went down. Now we're at 17. Uh, and, you know, I, I really think that if that the, the province-wide lockdown mandate hadn't come into uh, effect, we were in a good place on January 24th to get back to playing hockey. Um, um, this is a, this is kind of a difficult report. I, I don't really know the hard costs of mothballing an arena in January and February. That's not something that we've ever done before. I, I can't, I can't put a, a hard number on it. I know that, um, there was some email sent from local user groups and this year's user, this year was even, even tougher because there was more than one, um, you know, minor hockey group that were, you know, using our, our rink, um, I, I think this, this recommendation is the, the prudent recommendation. Um, um, if we were to uh, keep the ice in until uh, I think February 11th is the next time that, you know, the, the minor hockey and other groups could take, could take back to the ice, um, you know, it would be a risk, a risk that, that, um, you know, that this lockdown wouldn't be extended another month, right? So, um, you know, this is one of those council quandaries that uh, council are going to have to look at and, and, and uh, pick a side here. So I'm uh, definitely open to uh, your questions on, on this detail. It's kind of a tough one. So, Go, uh, ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, Your Worship. Uh, through your worship, uh, the discussion occurred earlier today about the possibility of extending the season should a later start get done. And, and I feel like um, both staff and, and, uh, and management uh, failed to exercise why we didn't have that as a suggestion in our report. Um, I just want to remind council that there is plans 
and approved grants for two different capital projects going on in the community center after this ice season. So as you know, we were successful through the Trillium grant for Jake, you can quote me, I believe the chill, uh, condenser and the chiller. And then we were also successful through the provincial and federal government to replace boards and the floor upgrades as part of that. So we were intending following this season to be under repairs and renovations in preparation for the 2021 season. So we are aware of the, the possibility that user groups may desire to be extended, um, but we're forecasting that we should if not be under tender um, provisions, we will be looking to, to get prepared for potential capital work that's already been approved. Um, so I spoke with the arena supervisor today, which is a second option, which is not included on this report. The earliest alternative that could be used is February 11th. That's the 28th day of the, uh, of the current imposed lockdown. Even if they regionally opened, we would be operable for approximately four more weeks of contracted season. Normally we keep our users in contract till the end of the March break with the adult groups using for the last two weeks to finish that season. So I, I think that's the important part. We wanted to say that that's essentially almost four weeks away. The other alternative to that is if it was desired that we open up our arena for a month, it, the estimate that Al Fenwick, our arena supervisor gave me, would be around five to $8,000 to get the arena back up and running should we decide to get that arena and reinstall the ice, maybe do without the painting of logos for the last month, but give another alternative to the community. Um, I reassure him and Jake, you could tell by the difficulty in his report, this is a, a difficult conversation that all of our staff had as it's perceived as though we're throwing in the white flag to some activity for youth and some opportunity to get some normalcy back. Um, this is strictly a financial decision as far as we can't predict the future and we don't want to impose a budget shortfall before we enter a large part of the budget year. We have had greater than normal revenues in the arena season, but it was that September through December arena revenue that actually saved our shortfall from earlier in the COVID pre precautions that required us to close our facility early. So that recovered our 2020 budget. We're just trying to ensure that we don't have a, a, a large deficit to contend with right off the bat in 2021. So the more details have come out since that report was done as far as potential options. And I just want to make sure that council were aware of those as well. Go ahead, Jake. I just, just wanted to respond to uh, one thing Brian said, we do have a considerable amount of construction approved in principle to take place in this off season. Um, but we've had kind of a holdup and that's the federal and provincial um, governments through the latest um, grant um, haven't given us a, approval to really start any of that process yet. Um, it is going to, I mean, it is going to be really incredibly hard for, um, you know, this construction activity to start, you know, early on in that, in that uh, um, shutdown, like, like it'll probably be impossible to get, things going in April or May even uh, with that construction activity. It's just one of those things where you got to wait for your, your approval so that you can actually build the tenders. And, and uh, anyways, we can't do anything as per, as per uh, uh, their instruction at this point. So. so we have been approved though, correct, Jake? We've been approved. Just but we can't go forward. any of the costs that we would do in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, design right now would would not be paid for by that grant so we can't even really get design starts started yet because they wouldn't pay for it as part of the grant anyways just before i go to you when I, i've talked mike basio called me the other day there and and they said um within three weeks they've passed that at the federal level and they will be starting to move on it so that was i think last thursday or friday so he said but three weeks or so you should should be moving on their level. Go ahead, Wenda. Um, I, I, maybe it's premature, but I'd like to make a motion that we defer this um, vote until our next council meeting. Um, two weeks will have gone by. You can't do anything with the grants or the designs or anything like that. And uh, if the numbers are coming down as they suggest they are, um, you know, we may be able to open up again. Um, so um, I would just like to delay the vote 
for another two weeks until our next council meeting. So I, I guess our next council meeting is early February. February 1st, Your Worship. February 1st, yeah. yeah. So did you make that a motion, did you, Wendy? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, no, I just didn't know what you did, and I just missed that part, yeah. Yeah, I was okay. debating, but I, I yes, I, I'm going to okay, make, make a motion. motion. We have a second for that motion. Kevin, do you second that? Yes, I will, Eric. Just okay. uh, for, for the fact that it is devastating for uh, the children out there as it is. And, you know, we, if we can hold off a couple more weeks, I don't think it's going to make or, make or break us one way or the other. It's sort of, it's, it's shut off now and down to the, the uh, just a matter of keeping the, the ice in. So I don't think it'll hurt to watch, see where COVID goes, if at all possible. And if they open things up again, we could we could possibly be able to uh, to move on with it, but I, I don't think it would hurt a couple of weeks. Any comments or questions there? Or anything else? Go ahead, Doug, and then Sherry. Yeah, just just one. In the information that's been provided to us, there's no uh, there there's no cost uh, uh, in there for labor, so it's hard to make a business case based on what we made in November. Uh, or what we income was in November without taking the cost of labor and hydro out of there. And I'm only questioning in that uh, for that month that may be less that we could use it. We should know actually what the profit range is there uh, worthwhile for, for make it worthwhile in a business case model for us. But other than that, I'm willing to wait two weeks too. Sherry, do you have something? Yeah, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone else has heard differently, but I thought they weren't doing any more regional um, lockdowns, that it was either going to be provincial or nothing. So even if our numbers are low, we may still be locked down because the rest isn't. That's my concern. All right, there's no more questions. We have a motion on the floor by Wendy and second by Kevin. All in favor of the motion? That's Moses Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will go to the next one here. Just to get my papers right here. Council updates on no. Eight Stone, Stone Mills building activity report. Oh, yes, yep, uh, building department activity. Yeah, okay, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, this is just an item for information. Um, yeah, we did a pretty, pretty excellent year last year. Um, I think somewhere in the, somewhere in the proximity of $180,000 in revenue and $120,000 in, uh, in, in the building department uh, expenditures. Um, and I'm, I'm expecting with part eight that uh, we're going to make a lot more money next year as well. So I, I was just, uh, I think council needs to be aware sometimes of what the numbers are. And um, yeah, 38 new homes and uh, generally not small new homes being built. And I just, just wanted to, you know, it's important for council to, to, uh, to know that we're trending in a positive direction. That's all. So. Any questions for Jake? Motion to receive the report. By Doug, second by Sherry. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Uh, committee boards and reports. Uh, Jake, a discussion on the reopening building from the Camden East Library demolition. Yeah, this is another item for information. Um, uh, last council, we were uh, given the authority, no matter what number came out, to to uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, give this uh whoever the winner was award the contract and um and happy to say we got four uh prices back and a local company which was kind of concerning i think at the last meeting um uh, was awarded the contract for thirty nine thousand, which i think is an excellent price i don't know how yeah. they do things so cheaply <laughs> okay questions um, for Jake? your worship yeah go ahead it appears that we skipped tonight uh we skipped the section we should be on the items for consideration. 
which this topic is actually the discussion on repurposing a building material. Jake's report should actually come under the items for information, which is actually the one he just spoke to. So you oh, should yeah. have your you should have your discussion on repurposing building materials, which was oh, sorry. Deputy yeah, sorry, I got the wrong one. It's okay. okay. And then the TCDC stuff. Okay, sorry, so I just want to make sure we had them in order. Yeah, well, we got the one for information. I know everybody um, except uh, received the motion for that. All in favor? Now we're going to go back to items for consideration discussion on re repurposing building material for the Camden East Library demolition. Go ahead, Jake. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> really aware. Uh, I didn't read this report, so can, can anybody fill me in on what this means? There's actually no report, Your Worship. This is a, this is a discussion okay. that has okay. been occurring at Council in various, uh, you know, strides. Um, there's been some discussion about repurposing material, keeping facade, etc. And for the most part, they've been brought forth by single council members. As we're getting ready to award later on in the meeting, um, which has already technically been completed, but if there's any direction specific, um, as, as a council by quorum, we would like to make sure that, uh, that we give those directions to the, to the demolition. Don't you have something? Yeah, well, I, I think I probably started it off way back uh, several months ago when I requested that some of the uh, gingerboard facade, the facade, uh, the blue board that's at the top of the building, that a section of that be saved. And my thought process was at that time that if we were to build a small post office building there, that we would maybe put a section of that old building, the, the blue gingerboard uh, uh, on it, just in memory of the old building uh, there. So anyways, I'd still like to have a section of that saved if possible. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything in the building where salvage. Anybody else? Okay, I mean, I know Doug, you you um, mentioned this here, but what's the rest of council think? John, well, I think it's a it's a good idea. That that yeah. is nice woodwork up at the top there. Um, there's also some nice woodwork around the library door. I just don't know, um, you know, what it would take to save that. To, if Westendorf would come back and say, well, we're going to have to add to our bill because that wasn't part of the uh, uh, the original proposal. Um, so I guess if it's if it's not adding cost uh, or a significant cost, I, I don't see why we wouldn't try to save some of that for possible future use. Jake, you got your hand up there, go ahead. Yeah, I, I actually listened to what council tells me. It was written right in the RFQ. They got to return it to us, all of it. Okay. Good enough. Okay, so. Uh, have a motion received that report? No, it's not. No. Well, this no. got to have a verbal thing here. You have this report. Moved by Kevin, second by Sherry. All in favor? Carried. Next was letter to council from TEDC to update the activities of the 2021 to ensure awareness and confirmation of insurance oh. liability coverage for group endorsed events. Brenda? Uh, just make a motion to receive. Motion to receive. Thank you. Second there. Debbie? Questions? All in favor? Carried. So we did the first time this information. So the next one is Stone Mills Rooftop Revenue Generation Update. Go ahead, John. Yeah, as TEDC, TECDC was actually requesting that we confirm that we are going to continue that insurance coverage. So um, oh. if you want something <laughs> added to that motion or make a subsequent motion to confirm that? I believe I got yeah. that right. Is that not so, Brian? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah. Can you add something to that motion then? Yes, uh, please. Okay, good enough, sorry. Your Worship, so if, if, if I may, I just intend to utilize the recommendation that, that's been presented on the agenda, if that's concurrent with council. Okay, council confirmed council their intent. Receive council the list of activities and that further the yep. council confirmed their intent to continue okay. to provide for liability coverage for TECDC. Right. Okay, Wenda, that? Uh, yeah, sorry. The yes. Seconder. All in favor? I guess. Okay. okay. Now we'll go to the Stone Mill Revenue Generation Update. Questions or Jake? Anybody want to go over this? Doug. 
Yeah, I can't get it up right now, but when I was looking at it earlier, I noticed that uh, there's a discrepancy of about $10,000 in revenue uh, for the uh, year, for like one of the years in between the other two years. So I'm wondering, do we have some panels out that aren't working? In the one time there, we have some panels up there that weren't working at one time. Yeah, we have had in the past. And I'm just that needed to repair, yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering that again, that uh, when I spot that there's a 10,000 reduction in revenue, uh, you know, was it all due to poor sunlight or was is there some panels out? I can't, for some reason right now, it won't open for me. There it comes. Keep in mind that December is not included on the report, Council. Okay. All right, just, oh, yeah, just, yeah. just check it out. Yeah, so we have regular, uh, We, I mean, it's it's all uh, basically computerized. If, if one panel goes out, usually it's the micro inverters that go out. And um, we have a company that's in charge of, of uh, replacing all the equipment when it goes out, Doug. So, um, and, and they, they send us the bill now. There's, we have to pay the labor and, um, um, yeah, so I, I think what you're looking at, Doug, if there's, you know, years where you're making more and years where you're making less, you're, you're seeing just sunlight levels different. Okay. No, just, uh, it never hurts to check when it comes to money. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Especially this time of year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Looking for a motion that the council received the stone mill solar top revenue generation update. Moved by Debbie, second by Doug. All in favor? Carried. Okay, Quinney Conservation Board meetings. Um, John, I think you've got to brought to our attention on that. I don't think there's anything in there, but uh, yeah. um, just a heads up, uh, there's a, a control structure that has failed at 13 Island da Lake. It's just a sort of a culvert uh, with a, I think a control gate in it. Um, it's going to have to be replaced. Um, I think it's going to come in in the neighborhood of 400,000. Um, the authority will apply uh, for a WECI grant. That's the water and erosion control structure grant to, to Ministry of Natural Resources. That's a 50% grant, which would bring it down to 200,000 ballpark. Um, based on our on formulas that the Conservation Authority uses, a small part of that cost will accrue to the township because there's a downstream benefit to the township. Uh, in terms of, uh, of water storage and, and slow release and so on. So um, that's just something that uh, that we should anticipate in the in the coming in the coming year. But uh, I don't think there's anything particular in this. Uh, in would, this they like, would they grab something like would they grab something like that this summer, John? Yeah, it's it's just in the uh, in the design and discussion stage right now, Eric. So uh, yeah. whatever the final design, there's a number of options. And uh, yeah. I don't think we've been settled on, on what the final option is going to be. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Kev, or, um, sorry, Brian, do you have something? Sorry, Your Worship. Uh, I know this concept may be new to Quinney Conservation, but um, Deputy Revised, has there been any discussion whether the municipality may be given an opportunity to complete that work? Or is that something that would have to be posted uh, for competition uh, based on the grant application? That's a good question. It's in, it's in South Frontenac. So it, it would be, I assume, if, if the municipality could do the work, it would be South Frontenac's crew okay. to do that work. Um, but uh, you're right, I've, I've never uh, come across a situation like that before. It's usually because, because dam work is so um, particular and specific uh, in the type of engineering uh, and construction that's required, it's usually done by specialized contractors. Thank you. Kevin, go ahead. John, you're saying that our municipality may have to pay some of that uh, cost on that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the same with, with any dam that has more than a local benefit. Um, for example, the dams at, at Second and Third Depot Lake would benefit the entire Napanee River. So anytime work is done on them, uh, it falls to uh, uh, Greater Napanee, Stone Mills, uh, South and Central Frontenac, uh, and I think that's all. Uh, maybe a bit to loyalists, although they have a minimal amount of land in, in Quinney Conservation. We all share the cost. And well, it's see, based on a formula that's, that determines how much benefit accrues to each particular municipality. Um, 
I can get some of that <laughs> that calculation information for you if you want, Kevin. No, I, I was just interested in because we had to redo the Colebrook Dam there. But again, that's not a control dam. That's right. Uh, like as these ones are. So I, I understand what you're saying there. So yeah, that just thing. had a local recreational benefit, really, and to a certain extent, Correct. A groundwater benefit for Colebrook. No, that's right. Okay. Good enough. I have a motion to receive the Quinney Conservation Minutes. Moved by Sherry, second by Wenda. All in favor? Carried. New business and statements from members. I guess nobody's got any. Okay, we'll go to the confirming bylaw. Motion to move by Doug, second by Sherry. All in favor? Carried. Motion to adjourn. Moved by John, second by Wenda. Good night, everybody.